Um, this is Charlie Everyone. He currently works at the Bluefield Daily Telegraph, but he has a long history oh, yeah, of yeah. a bunch of things. Oh, 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 According to this beautiful paper, he is a Oakville High School, Concord University, University of Charleston in South Carolina, and the University of South Carolina graduate for a bunch of degrees. He also served in the U.S. Army for three years, and he has worked at the Bluefield Daily Telegraph, the Richlands News Press, the Richmond Times Dispatch, and the Franklin News Post, and the Martinsville Bulletin. A lot of places good. to My work. My God, that's really good. Yeah. Very, very detailed. Thank you. He's won numerous press association awards for reporting, editorial writing, and column writing, and he's now finishing his first novel. Is that true, or have you finished it? it? I, it's just pretty much finished. Pretty much finished. All right. He also has four, I'm guessing, wonderful children. Of course. Four wonderful children. Oh, yeah, the best in the world. The best. Yeah. And he's here to speak to us today about writing personal essays. Yes. Is that what it is? Personal essays. And it's Aunt Eb. 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 Aunt Eb. Well, uh, yeah, if, if you uh, come from a family like I did, a very large family, uh, a lot of, not many people were actually called by their real names. There was always some sort of nickname. And it usually originated when they were growing up and somebody couldn't pronounce her name, so they would, like her name was Evelyn, but somebody couldn't say Evelyn, so they said Ev, Ev, Ev Evelyn, Ev, and that's where the Ev, and the Ev came from. Aww. So, yeah. just a quick interjection then here, before Charlie takes over. Um, and are you about done, or are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm done okay. with it. That was my spiel. This is Charlie. I want to throw a word yeah, for you all to think about and allow it to kind of <laughs> percolate in your minds because we, we all, we're all looking for labels. How do you describe a certain style of writing, etc.? And I'd like to import a word from India that Gandhi used. It's called homespun. Homespun. And Charlie his writing, if you look at his op-eds, they're homespun. And, and they all have to do with a simple life. This is all about community. And I'm a big fan of community newspapers. Because without them, I can assure you, whatever I have been doing and continue to do over the years, I would never have been able to because it is in these homespun kinds of writing, all about community and so on, that I have found the, the, the treasures about our area and been able to share them then with folks from close to 100 countries over the years. And they have gone home feeling so wonderful about their experiences in West Virginia. And to this day, they remember us very fondly. So we have a lot of friends worldwide because of homespun folks and writers such as John. Okay. So, all yours. OK, thank you. <laughs> uh, has anybody had an interesting experience with you? Anything happened to you of note or that you shared with other people? Yeah, I actually was able to um, go with my dad, actually, matter of fact, just about three or four weeks ago, and we got to meet the president over the like, Sierra Club and some of those that were meeting for a meeting. And um, they actually knew my dad by first name. Um, he was, he's actually been able to pray over all their prayer breakfasts. So it was nice meeting all those folks. Okay, and, and if you were going to write about that, mm -hmm. uh, what 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 do you what do you uh, could you turn that into a personal essay? More than likely, yes. Yeah, yeah, you probably you yeah. probably good because that's basically what it's about. Yeah. it's about your own experiences. Right. And, uh, and you know, rule number one in writing: write about what you know. And obviously, nobody knows your life better than you do and what happened to you and uh, what you've learned from it. And when you relate that to other people, what, you're, what, do, you want, what do you want to do? What do you, what do you want them to, 
when they read something you write, when you're relating this personal experience, what do you, what impact do you want to have on? Well, I think that the greatest thing that I took out of it was that all of these people had a really, you know, they were very well known individuals and in what they did with their companies and, and all the different shows that they traveled around internationally. But they were like such a, um, it was so nice that we all had something in common. They liked the same foods that all of us in the country liked. And if where my dad chose like pinto beans and cornbread, they all eat pintos and cornbread. If they had been in another setting, they probably wouldn't have that. It probably had steak and potatoes and whatever, lobster and whatever. But because dad um, and they all had one sh common area of focus and that was their tour guiding and the hunting and fishing and things like that. Mm -hmm. They actually all had a simple, they all become a simple, just everyday person, even though they had quite a title. And it was nice hearing them talk about being in the country and, and uh, sharing their own personal, you know, childhood and, and adult experiences. But it, it was from a whole view of if it was like us sitting right here versus them standing behind the, you know, the podium. It was really nice to have that different reflection of them. Yeah, yeah, you, you hit on what uh, Jamie was talking about with the homespun. Yeah. In the sense that you can take almost any situation like that and you can find common denominator. Right. Because we're all human and we all think alike and uh, you know, do things very much alike. Mm -hmm. And so once you find those common denominators, then you can, you can add your own personal touch to your experience mm -hmm. to share, to make a point. Mm -hmm. Because that's one of the questions with personal essays. Yeah, we all have experiences. A lot of things happen to us. But does anybody else care? There's much difference to make. Right. It's like if you're tweeting, you tweet, well, you know, I just cooked uh, fish for dinner. Does anybody care? <laughs> Probably not. You know, they don't want to hit that. You know. but, but, but you can make them care because of, through your personal essay. Right. And how do you do that? How do you, how do you make it interesting enough to where they're going to care? Oh, well, how I would, well, yeah, I would just... I would just um, share like the, I would just share some pointer reactions like, well, you know, this individual was talking about Jack Coe, or that, you know, he had this nice, you know, he had seen this nice grizzly bear in the woods, but, you know, some leading, some of the actions that was leading up to that. Okay, and, uh, and fortunately, uh, you know, all of us had very similar experiences, uh, regardless of the age. That uh, Jimmy and Jim, we can all go back to remember when we were 20 years old and some of the things we did and uh, some of the things we wished we hadn't done, but that just comes with the territory. But when you're writing a personal essay, you know, that's it's about your experience, it's about what you know, you need to make it interesting. And, and when, when, how do you judge if somebody's going to be interested in it or not? I mean, how do you get that? If you're, if you're, when you're writing, you have to think, okay, how, what kind of impact is it going to have on somebody else when they read? How do you judge that? Do you judge that? Well, for myself, it'd be like in the first two or three lines. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> Either grabs you or you're done. Good point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, that's a very good point. But it's also a matter of what grabs your attention when you read. Think about that. You know, if you're reading something, what, what makes you interested in it? Want to keep on reading? You always have to keep that in mind, mm -hmm. and and that's exactly right. That's on a news story of any anything, any for any writing. You better grab them quick. You better say something that's going to get their attention, and they might want to read more about it. And that's true in almost any writing, but certainly with the, with personal essays in particular. That's very that's very different writing from academic or legal or medical because you're just speaking a particular group of people's language there. Nobody else is going to read it and they know what you're talking about and they don't care. Mm -hmm. The personal essays, is, you know, like Ernest Hemingway, appeals to anybody. Anybody can read it and anybody can get something out of it. So that, that so you always have to, that lead is, 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 is crucial. And another crucial point is your audience. Who's going to read it? Now obviously we all want to write to where everybody it's going to be interested in reading, but you know what? That's not going to happen. It's just not. It doesn't make you a difference how great a writer you are. It's not going to happen. Some people have no interest in whatsoever. So you got to have, if you were, for example, if you were writing for Bluefield Bay Telegraph, 
and if you're writing personal essays. For somebody like me, that's easier to do because I grew up in this area. Homespun people, you know, had a big family, got a lot of characters to write about. And most people who read this, a lot of them are older, they can relate to this, they can relate to these experiences. And uh, so that makes it a little, but what if I were, you know, I was in Richmond. If I'm writing the personal essay in Richmond, am I going to write about the, exactly the same as I do here? Probably not. I might, I might write about the same topics and even include some of the exp same experiences, but it's, I'm not going to use the cultural references here as much, uh, or there as much as I would here, because people who grew up in Richmond are probably not going to relate to them very well. And I wouldn't even attempt to do that in Richmond until I lived there for a while and got to know that, the, the city and the people there, what they thought. And the same thing, I used to live in Charleston, South Carolina. It's one of my favorite places to go. But, you know, when you're there, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very different culture. So you, you have to know your audience. And uh, you can, a lot, of, a lot of the personal essays can be, have universal appeal, regardless. But especially when you're writing, like for a newspaper in a particular area, it's better to, as much as you can to relate to your particular audience that you're writing to. And hopefully it, it has nothing to do with age, too. You've got to make it entertaining and, and try to grab their interest. And all right, here, here's a column I read a couple of years ago. And some people will understand what I'm talking about, and some people won't. But, but the, the lead in this is a note of warning. Please don't try this. It's dangerous. And besides, you can't get away with it these days. So you, when you see that, like, okay, now what are you talking about? You know, you're, you're going to relate an experience that's dangerous, and you probably shouldn't do it, but you want to find out what that is. So, and, uh, the decision to go was a sudden one, motivated by nothing in particular, as I recall. My brother Barry and I uh, went to see my sister who lived in Fairfax. We were both living in Oakville. Everybody knows where Oakville is. Okay, in Mercer County. Uh, at the time, so it was a nice drive, taking about four, four and a half hours or so, if you've ever driven from Oakville to Fairfax, uh, depending on which way you go, but that's usually how much but this was an era of CB, Citizen Band radios. Does everybody know what a Citizen Band radio is? Okay, good. So, so you, most people do, even young people generally know what that is. So driving took on a bit of a different ambiance with communication between drivers, a routine pastime. And keep in mind, nobody had cell phones. There were no cell phones at this time. So that, that, that was the way they did it. And of course, they had codes. Like, that's a big 10-4, good buddy. Anybody know what that means, 10-4? Yeah. What does it mean? It correct, yes. Yes, exactly, yeah. <laughs> I agree, yeah, big 10-4, good buddy. Good buddy was, you know, a common term. It may still be, I don't know. <laughs> does anybody even have CB radios in your political? I guess some people do. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, they talk like that on the CBs, using first responder radio codes. Of course, 10 4 being meant you understood and acknowledged what was said. Using the word big with it meant the message was received and got a strong endorsement. Movies about C CBs were even made, including the classic Smokey and the Bandit. Everybody thinks Smokey and the Bandit. Oh, if you haven't, you got to see it. You know, write that down as a, as a must see movie. You will love it, I guarantee it. And Burt Reynolds had just died recently started, but he was young and he was so cool. And, <laughs> uh, and Breaker Breaker, Convoy, uh, that was also some of these songs, Convoy, that was a big thing <coughs> at the time as well. But each driver had a CB, also had a handle, a nickname, which was used over the air. I never had a CB, but my brother had one in his 1964 Chevy Impala, which sported a 390 cubic inch, cubic inch engine and a five-speed first shifter. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. That's a little bit different language there, but that was the thing to have at that time because it was a very, very fast car. I don't know. Do they catch cars that fast anymore, Jim? I don't, even know. I don't think so. I don't think they do. I mean, these cars were unbelievably fast. Yeah. And um, so we took off east on Route 46 to Christiansburg to pick up Interstate 81. 
and then Interstate 86 to Fairfax. As soon as we left, he got on his radio, signing off with his handle, Mountain Stallion, I believe it was. Of course, uh, it was wishful thinking on his part. Uh, uh, the, the purpose of the CB was to help each other be on the lookout for smoke. Does everybody know what smoky means? Cops. Cops. Yeah. Where the smoky bear hat, yeah. <laughs> we say, you're learning something today. Uh, it, uh, which meant the law, since they wear smoky bear hats. The CB world had its own lingo, a, a word of expression, or just, uh, just for just about anything. The name Smokey was part of the title of the movie, as we all know, Burt Reynolds handled Bandit. Uh, my brother quickly searched for some driving buddies and found plenty. Learning of any spottings of uh, radar, they called that Kojak with a Kodak, or a slowdown, brake check, or even the location of any law at all, like a bear in the bushes or grass, they called it. Right. So that's the language they used to, to let everybody know that there's danger around. It was a bit tricky on 460, but he still managed to maintain a good clip, <coughs> the specifics of which I won't mention. Is there a statute of limitations on the speeding violation? Well, he would routinely, we were getting the speed of 90 to 100 miles an hour. Yeah. These cars would fly, and uh, you do that with, on the CBs, you would communicate, and you would find out if there were any cops in the area, and you'd clear sight. you go. <laughs> The real action started on Interstate 81, though, because that's where the truckers were. And, I, and all of them had CBs back then. Sure enough, it wasn't long before we heard a breaker and a warning about a state trooper near the Aronto exit near Roanoke. Just a few minutes later, we got the clear message that Smokey was gone, <coughs> and it was pedaled to the metal. We were darting in and out of traffic, riding along with truckers, often with one in front and one behind. In fact, hiding from the law, back then meant being in the cradle, which put your car in the right lane with one truck in front of you, one truck behind you, and one truck alongside you so nobody could even see. If they were flying, you were too. And so it, in the movie Smoking Defense, he actually did this so that they'd already got him on radar, but he couldn't find him. They just couldn't find him. So the cradle kind of friend. <laughs> Through a series of CB exchanges, we could figure out who the shaker in the trees was, or the leader of the convoy of sorts, with traffic running together on the same stretch of road for one purpose, to drive as fast as possible, but safety, but safely without getting caught. The shaker would have to drive a little cautiously as the information was passed on down the line, with others turning turning into something, uh, or tuning in something to spot it or there's any kind of obstacle or traffic jams or a wreck or something like that. I was concerned about an astronaut Anybody know what an astro? Probably not an astronaut. That's a police plane or helicopter. Yeah. I don't think they do that much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they they some signs. Uh, I see the signs. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> Check by aircraft. Yeah, that's what they did. Yes. Uh, but no word on anything like that. Although we, although we knew none of those we talked to on the CB, Oh, we didn't know him personally. We felt you, you got to feel like part of the community very quickly because you got to know people under the circumstances. And you looked out for each other. Uh, I have no doubt that any of those guys, a lady or two too, would have stopped to help at any time. It was the first and only time we made such a trip. But at the same time, but at the time, it seemed it would be the first of many. So that, that's, the other, that's the only time I made a trip like that, but at the time, oh, you know, we're going to do this a lot. I mean, this is great. This is fun. I mean, we're going to keep doing this. That, and that often happens in life. So it's always better to cherish the moments by thinking an experience may be the last rather than first. But I remember it well, and of course, that slice of life will never be the same. That, it, that, that, that those things just don't happen anymore, I don't think. Maybe they do. I'm just out of the loop, but I don't think they do. Uh, we pulled up into my sister's driveway, and this little about three hours after we left my boat at our own well. So it's probably just as well it was a one-time thing because fortune doesn't always smile on the folly of youth. And that's very true. So so when you that 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 experience happened, it happened just like I said it did. 
it happened at a, a slice of life where there was just kind of a subculture of, uh, of CBs and radars and these gangs. Bonnet stood up and took her fist and hit him, hit him as hard as she could. And that was the end of that. But that that's the type of person she was. She could she could be just the most sweetest, gentlest, perfect person you've ever seen. The biggest tar do anything in the world for you. But she could she was rough and tumble. And uh, she didn't take anything off anybody. And she was one of these people, I don't know if you ever met them. She had the innocence of a child in her honesty. And uh, you know, children don't use filters. I mean, they say what they think. And what, all of you eventually will have children and, and realize that you got to be careful what you say around them. you got to be careful what you do around them. Because they might tell the wrong people at the wrong time without hesitation. They can be very embarrassing. And she was like that. I mean, she just said what she thought. She had no filters. It was just anything she said, you knew she was telling the truth. No question about it. And I'm sure, you know, we, we know people like that from time to time. You know, you know they're, they're, they're not capable of lying. And that's the way she was. Anytime you have a character in your life, just like Jamie said, I mean, people tend to be very fascinated by her. And, uh, and, and there, there, there was reason to be. And, and as you're, certainly if you're writing personal essays, all of you should pay very close attention to the people in your life. And part of writing personal essays is also the art of analysis. I mean, how many of you do that? When you meet other people or get to know them, how many of you try to figure them out? Does everybody do that? Mm -hmm. I think you kind of do that almost all the time. Yeah. You're on your toes. You're on your toes all the time. Or you don't want to be, be taken in. You know, you assess people's personality, you assess their honesty, mm -hmm. you know, can you trust them, what can you tell them, I mean, you look for things you might have in common with that you can talk about. And sometimes you want to, and sometimes you want the other way. <laughs> it's all about trust. It's, it's about, about trust. trust, yes. How much do you want to share uh -huh. of yourself? Give yourself. Give yourself, yeah. And again, everybody's different, and that's what makes the world go around, uh, those differences. But when you're writing personal essays, that analysis of other people is crucial. You've got to be able to do that. And it doesn't, you don't have to have a degree in psychology to do it. A lot of it's just common sense. And that's the gift that somebody like on Ed had. She just had that basic common sense. And see, you're, you're playing a role too here. I mean, you're, you're willing to share something from your family, its, it's experiences. And that, that, I think, also takes courage. Right? And it's like spilling the beans and you know, skeletons in the closet, those kinds of things. Yes, things. yeah. So it's, it's so that, that's something that, uh, and, and believe me, I've been criticized over the years by my own family. For, for bringing up things that didn't assume, especially with, with my, uh, you know, my parents. My parents were divorced at a time when there weren't that many divorces. So I've written about those things before. And it's remembered, especially if he remarried and I have half brothers and sisters, they're not, they're not big fans. Because I've written about, you know, about some of that. And uh, I did one column when my father died. And, you know, these are personal things that you write about. You, and you know that somebody's going to read, they're not going to like it. And, and uh, so at my father's funeral, all he had seven children, three by, uh, by, by I have one brother and one sister, and, and, and uh, three half sisters and a half brother, so another, uh, another married. And we all came to the funeral, we were all asked to get up and speak. So I was one of the last ones, and my sibling and half siblings got up and started speaking. And I was sitting there thinking, where the hell am I? Who's, who's in that coffin there? It ain't my father. <laughs> Who the hell are they talking about? <laughs> yeah. So when I got up to speak my piece, I was trying to well, say something good about him. So, you know. and, I, and I found something fairly positive. It was a, a story that I left out a lot of the sort of details, but nevertheless, uh, 
in the uh, and, and again, these are stories you write about in your past, and all of us are going to have things we, we can't go into too much detail about. It depends on the, the family and the family newspaper. But uh, anybody ever been, well, you're not old enough yet, I guess, to be a, be a beer joint. I mean, beer joint, there's actually two of them still left in Mercer County. Did you know that? There are two beer joints in Mercer County. There's the Bullseye down where I live. And then there's the last resort over near Concord College, or Concord University. There's mm -hmm. only two left in the county. Yes. See? <laughs> and they were popular years ago. I have no idea how many were in Mercer County, but I'm sure it was probably 15 or 20 at least. And these are basically places you go in, they have the uh, sawdust on the, <coughs> on the wood floors, pool table, a little booth, and, you know, on the counter, and they have stools, and they sell beer. People go in there, they said they drink beer. And they have snacks, like pickled eggs and things like that to eat. That's what they were. And that's where people went, and they were very, very popular. And uh, to make a very long story short, uh, I was at the Bullseye one night drinking. It ended up with, I don't have any idea who this woman was or where she came from, but, we, but I was taking her home. And she lived uh, in Rich Creek, uh, and and we decided to make a little detour down on New River. Anybody ever been in that area down there? Uh, I didn't realize they were working on the road, and so when I made a left turn to keep in mind we've been drinking beer all evening too. Again, don't don't do this. Never never do this. Uh, next thing I knew, I was in a ditch. And these experiences, you want to write in a way that other people are going to find interesting. It maybe learn something from, hopefully, or learn what not to do in this case. But uh, this, this is what it's about. And I was, uh, and I wrote a personal essay one time, a column, about my own family experiences, which you got to be careful. I mean, you, and I did get in trouble with this because it didn't please everybody. But you know what? It was the truth. And if writing is anything, it should be honest. And uh, so, uh, but anyway, I it it. Uh, I started this out, but I went to my father's funeral, and I have six siblings, and I was one of the last to get up and speak, and they were up telling about my father, who was laying there in the coffin, and I didn't know who the hell they were talking about. Said, who is this man? I mean, that's not the man I knew. So I'm not going to go up, you know, get up and, and speak and, and say stuff that's not true about him. So uh, I thought, okay, well, what positive thing can I say about him? So that led to a uh, an incident in a beer joint called the Bullseye down near Oakville. Still there, still open, believe it or not. And there's another called the Last Resort, open near uh, Concord University. The last two, two that's surviving that I know of. Uh, so anyway, I, I ended up there drinking beer with a woman, got in the car, so I took her to Rich Creek, and got to Glenlyn, and was going to make a little detour down on uh, to New River. Oh, you're going to go down to the Sandbar. Yes! You know what the Sandbar is? Mm -hmm. oh, I'm, my. From our, I'm from Monroe County. Oh, okay, good. I have a lot of relatives in the room. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I know. I know we're doing pretty well, and I'm just really surprised. Yeah, from an county, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My, my second cousin, uh, Chris Booth, is the football coach at James Monroe High School. He kicked you know? her off the cheerleading. No. <laughs> kicked you off the cheerleading? No. Oh, that, that's assuming that I'm the type. <laughs> I don't like exercising that much. <laughs> All right, well, anyway, uh, I didn't, they had been working on the road, and I didn't realize what they, I, had, I didn't know that, or maybe I did, and just, well, you, please don't ever drink and drive like that. I mean, you, years ago, I mean, people did that. They did all the time. They really did, and that's true. But it, nowadays, the penalties are just simply too strict to take a chance on. But I ended up in a ditch, and I had this big, old, big, huge old bill, and that thing was not going anywhere. So I sat, sat there, and she was drunk, and she got hurt. She hit her head on the back. Oh, my God, she's probably going to die right here. <laughs> and, uh, I don't even know her name. And, and, I, and I thought, what am I going to do? And for the first time in my life, I thought, what would my father do? What would he do? And I knew. I got out of that car. I waited. The first trucker that came by, I flagged him down. And I said, would you help out? I want the police come. He stopped, got out of chain, pulled me out, I gave him 10 bucks. I took her home. But that's the first time in my life, that's what my father would have done. Because one of the positive things about him was, 
man, he could handle things. I mean, he didn't care. Whatever came up, let's do it. I mean, he, he, could, he could make a decision and handle things. And uh, so that was the story that I told at his funeral. And, so, and, and I wrote about this in a, in a personal lesson in a column. And needless to say, some of my family were very upset with me and, and told me about it. And I said, well, you know, you can be upset if you want to, but that's the truth. And when you're writing, first of all, Jimmy, we were just talking about, when you're writing about your own family, which I do a lot, that's a chance you take. Because you may even think that what you're writing is great. You're not, you're not, you know, you don't mean to insult them or anything, but they take it. So it, and, and it's, we're talking about the, you know, the, the writing of personal essays and, and why they, uh, anybody can write, for, anybody can, anybody can. We were just talking earlier, but I'm sure that all of you could probably tell me an experience that you've had recently that you could sit down and write a personal essay about. Anybody? And if you do, then you can submit it by this Friday. <laughs> Oh, okay. I thought you said we've extended it. Oh. So, so you can, up to this Friday, if you get a brainstorm and want to share something, something you've learned or something others might learn from through a personal experience that you've had, write that personal essay and submit it. So, just so you know. But, this is the this is the kind of inspiration that I, I 